opportunity to have a reading in our newly renovated art gallery. I looking out here at all of you, many new faces and uh, good familiar faces as well. I'm Glenn Mitchell, one of the friends of the library, and we are just delighted to see you here and hope that if you're not already a friend of the library, you might consider becoming one. So you'll know about in advance all of the other exciting readings and film series and uh, musical events that we ho host here at least once a month. But this afternoon, we are delighted and honored to be able to have novelist Margot Lucy with us. And I just want to say a few words about Margot. This is not connected, so I'm just going to push this down. Who is going to read and talk with us from her most recent novel, Vanishing Verona. And then afterwards, we hope that uh, you'll be interested in asking her questions uh, about her writing life or about her writing practices. Or you might simply want to share comments about uh, what you feel attracts you to the work that you've read of hers. Margo Lizzie, who is living now in Cambridge and is writer in residence at the Emerson, at Emerson College, is the award-winning author of a story collection, Learning by Heart, as well as four additional novels, Homework, Criminals, The Missing World, and Eva Moves the Furniture, which was a New York Times notable book, an Atlantic Monthly Best Book of the Year, and a Penn Winship Finals. There have been quite a few interviews with Margot, and all of them are accessible on the web. And so I've been spending a bit of time over the past week reading these very generous interviews that she's given uh, with individuals and talking with uh, people from around the country. And in one of these interviews that was conducted by fiction writer Carol Burns as part of the Washington Post Off the Page, in which she was talking about the development of her novel, Banishing Verona, Lizzie explained why it's so essential to her that her work be accessible. And I thought this was a very um, telling thing to, uh, to kind of quote her words for you here. And she said, I think it's important for the obvious personal reasons that reading really saved my life when I was growing up. In my rather solitary childhood, I was extremely dependent on the library. Lizzie was herself enthralled with the Victorian novels such as Jane Eyre, among many of her favorites. And she says, where you can completely enter into the lives of the characters. And that still remains one of my deep ambitions as a writer, to make my readers feel as if the people in my books are like neighbors or friends, about, when, about whom you can have opinions or arguments, about whom you can approve or disapprove, their lives becoming an extension of yours extension of, of you, as if you, if you will, of your own life. Zeke, the main character in Banishing Verona, has Asperger's Syndrome, an autism spectrum disorder. The New York Times book reviewer had said that Zeke expands, as is fiction's mission, our notion of what being human can mean. Indeed, one of the extraordinary elements of this novel is the astonishing but believable view of the world through Zeke's eyes and his own evolving growth as a person through his experiencing and grappling with new understandings about sexual love, grave transcontinental risk-taking, faith and a quest for his beloved, and ultimately his ability for forgiveness. And as Carol Burns, again in her off-the-page interview comments, the directness of Margot Livesey's writing belies the complexity of her stories, which explore both the dark and light sides of human nature. And I must tell you also that uh, as someone who in her day job works with uh, teachers uh, who uh, themselves have had many experiences with children and adolescents and young adults with Asperger's Syndrome, um, I found this to be an amazingly, uh, not only accurate, but movingly compelling, and also, in many ways, such a realistic a portrayal of a young adult with Asperger's Syndrome. Uh, if one thinks about the, uh, the intent of all people with disabilities to become normalized within the, the world, this is a wonderful example of how a writer has taken us to this next step. And in fact, in one of her interviews, uh, she commented that she, at first she didn't think that she would even mention that Zeke had Asperger's. 
uh, but then later decided that she would, just to allay that kind of that reader anxiety of some uh, of some readers who might uh, have appreciated knowing earlier than later about that. But we're delighted to have Margot here, and welcome to the Concord Library. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, getting my first library card, which I did when I was about six years old, does remain one of the high points of my life, which you might think is a comment on the subsequent four and a half decades, but <laughs> I see as a comment on the library. <laughs> Praise for the library. I'm going to read a number of sections from Banishing Verona, and I hope um, I can make the jumps I'm taking in the novel make, make sense by explaining some of some parts of what's missing. Um, the novel has a very, uh, I always get this the wrong way around, the novel has a very simple premise and a quite complicated plot. So I'm going to read you a few pages from the opening so that you can see my um, simple premise. And then I'm going to jump around a little bit so that you can see some of my complex plot. That's um, and this is set in uh, more or less contemporary London, the, the section, I'm just the opening section that I'm going to read. And for those of you who are writers, um, you'll see me uh, trying to write a kind of prose, a sort of overstuffed prose. I think of it sort of like the sofas of my youth, you know, those very sort of burgeoning plump pieces of sofa. And this is meant to represent the inner life of my character. So there are a number of sentences that are slightly hard for me to read. <laughs> You'll hear me sort of stumbling a little bit. Um, but they're meant to convey something about my character's way of seeing the world. They are deliberate, even if they're not entirely successful. <laughs> he had replaced five light bulbs that day, and by late afternoon could not help anticipating the soft ping of the filament flying apart whenever he reached for a switch. The third time, the fixture in the hall, the thought zigzagged across his mind that these little explosions were a sign, like the two dogs he had come across in the autumn, Greyhound and Bulldog, locked together on the grassy slope of the local park. He had given them a wide berth. Still, he had felt responsible when on the bus next day, a man turned puce and fell to the floor. By the fifth bulb, though, he had relinquished superstition and was blaming London electricity. Some irregularity in the current, some unexpected surge was slaughtering the bulbs. He pictured a man at head office filling his idle moments by pulling a lever. Meanwhile, hour by hour, he emptied the upstairs rooms slipping the bulbs from bedside lights and desk lamps. He had just replaced the fifth bulb when the doorbell rang. Often, if he were up a ladder, Zeke did not bother to answer the knocks and rings of late afternoon. The owners of the house, the barrows, were away, and the callers were never for him. But now, the power of the sky, the flashes of light and dark, the weariness of working alone, all conspired to make even the prospect of rebuffing a smartly dressed double glazing salesman or a disheveled collector for Oxfam a pleasure. That was one of those <laughs> overstuffed sentences. Last Friday, in a similar mood, he had found a boy on the doorstep, thin as a junkie, pretending to be blind. He had the dark glasses, the cane, the fluttery stuff with the hands. You're a painter, he had said, sniffing slightly. Zeke had given him 50 pence. Later, he had looked out of the window and seen the boy sitting on a wall, reading a newspaper. <laughs> now, he set aside the wallpaper steamer and went to open the front door. On the doorstep, a woman, minus collecting tin or clipboard, filled his vision. He hadn't replaced the whole bulb yet, and in the dim light, her features took a moment to assemble. He made out a bright, dark eyebrows above a substantial nose and plump, glistening lips, the opposite of pretty. 
Briefly, Zeke was baffled. Then he went through the steps he'd learned from the poster he'd been given at the clinic. Eyes wide, a glimpse of teeth, corners of the mouth turning up rather than down. Usually these indicated a smile, which could, he knew, mean anger, but often meant the opposite. Yes, she was smiling, although not necessarily for him. Her expression had clearly been prepared in advance, but he admired the way she held her face steady at the sight of him and of his work clothes. His jeans and shirt were so paint spattered as to be almost a separate entity. Good afternoon. She stretched out a hand and seeing his white with plaster, faltered, neither withdrawing nor completing the gesture. Hi, he said, hating the single stupid syllable. She was tall for a woman, his height save for the doorstep, and dimly familiar, though not as herself. As she began to speak, he realized who she reminded him of, the bust of Beethoven on his father's piano. Something about the expansiveness of her features, the way her tawny hair sprang back from her forehead. I'm the Barrow's niece, she said. In the cold air, her breath streamed toward him, feathery plumes, carrying more words, perhaps an entire sentence, which seek lost, which seek lost as he took in the little beads of moisture on her upper lip. When her mouth stopped moving, he said, I'm Zeke, the painter. The Barrows are away. But they told you I was coming, she said, with no hint of a question. He was still wondering, had they or hadn't they, when she stooped and he saw that she was not alone. Before he could offer to help, she swept past him, a suitcase in each hand. He turned from closing the door to find she'd set the cases at the foot of the stairs and was standing in the doorway, surveying the living room. Under the influence of her attention, Zeke saw again what his work had revealed. The ragged plaster painted, not a single color, but in pale bands of blue and brown, gray and yellow, the work of some artist he couldn't name. Cool, she said. You could do a mural, hunting and fishing, golfing and shopping. I don't think your aunt and uncle. Then Zeke caught himself. Humor. That had always been tricky for him. Even a question about a hen crossing the road could make him pause. I told them it was a big job, he said. You never know what you'll find underneath the wallpaper. And Emmanuel, the guy who helps me, did his back in. How, she said. What? How, she patted the small of her own back. Did he hurt his back? Reaching for a corner, he claims. Snooker, not painting. In the bare space, their voices emerged as if they were on a stage. Hers was unusually deep, warm, and melodious. It made him think of the chiming of his favorite clock. As for his, Zeke wasn't sure. He'd read that humans hear their own voices through the jaw rather than the air. Every time a tooth is lost or filled, the timbre changes. When are my aunt and uncle due back, she said. This Saturday, they told me. She moved her head up and down and finally took off her coat. He'd noticed earlier returning from even a quick trip to the corner shop how the emptiness of the room made it seem as if the cold had followed him indoors. In fact, the heating was on full blast and the house was snug as a tea cozy. She retreated to sling her coat over the banister and advanced into the room in the same greedy way she'd entered the house, her dark green dress swaying as she walked. In the bay, she turned and he saw, silhouetted against the window, her belly. Don't, she said, let me interrupt your work. A sentence appeared in Zeke's head. I'd like to tie you to the bed. How did that get there inside his brain about this woman? He'd never done or even considered doing such a thing. I won't, he said. 
I don't think you have to be Marie Curie <clears throat> to see where this is heading. <laughs> um, this uh, tall, <coughs> impatient woman who looks a little bit like Beethoven um, is my eponymous heroine, Verona. In my mind, if not in those of her parents, she's named for the Italian city where Romeo and Juliet lived and loved and came to a not so good end. Um, and she inspires Zeke to do some astonishing things, and I'm going to read you one or two of those <coughs> astonishing things. But I want to just say a little bit about, about Asperger's syndrome and how I became interested in it. Um, and somehow this has become a rather pressing question after the publication of Mark Haddon's novel, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, um, uh, the narrator of which is severely autistic, quite severely autistic. Um, Zeke is not autistic. He, he has Asperger's, which is a much uh, milder, um, uh, much milder condition. I became interested in Asperger's in the early 90s when the only son of a dear friend was diagnosed with Asperger's. Um, at that time, I'd never heard of this condition, but I started keeping my friend and her son company um, by reading about it and also you know, by babysitting and the usual things. Um, and I became um, very intrigued by the condition. Uh, it was first diagnosed by a pediatrician, Hans Asperger, about 50 years ago, but has only really in the last decade become a fairly common diagnosis. Um, so um, one of the challenges of writing this novel was, um, was finding um, older people to talk to who had Asperger's, um, because the majority of the people I knew were, were, much, were much younger than my, my character, Zeke, um, who's 29. Um, I solved this by, by interviewing a number of people, they were, they were all men, who either did, the, a few of them did actually claim to have Asperger's, others I just diagnosed for myself. <laughs> and some of them I think were perhaps a little baffled by the line of questioning, but they were very, very patient with me, and I'm happy to say that several of them have gone on to read the novel and said, God, that guy's exactly like me, <laughs> but in the nicest way, the nicest way. Um, but one of the many things that, um, that struck me about my friend's son was that he couldn't read facial expressions. When he looked at a person's face, he did not see what we see when we say, she smiled, he frowned. He had to sort of figure out the face part by part, put the sort of bits together, and then say, oh, She's smiling. Now maybe a smile means, and then he had a list, and he had a poster that he brought home from the clinic he was going to, which gave you tw showed 12 common expressions, how to identify them and what they might mean. And I thought, how amazing, and how amazing it is that many of us actually do this thing without thinking about it for a second, that we don't even know how we learn to, to recognize expressions. We just, we just do it. Um, another thing that I found very fascinating about my friend's son, and this was corroborated again by further research, is that he can't lie. And he finds this um, deeply frustrating. He comes home from school saying, it is so frustrating. All the other children lie. And I say to him, well, why don't you? Uh, not perhaps very helpfully. And he says, I can't. He can't explain why he can't, but he can't. And um, certain aspects of, of language are, are, are hidden from him, from, from him, such as metaphors, subtexts, irony, humor, um, you know, which, um, of course, uh, makes courtship a little bit tricky, <laughs> as courtship is mostly about what lies beneath language rather than the surface of language. Um, it turned out, on, on reading further about Asperger's, that there are five or six um, characteristics or um, aspects to the condition. And if you have two or three, the books I read said blithely, then you ha you're probably somewhere on the continuum. And I must say that as I read this book, these books, I really felt that certainly I and many people I knew were at times on the Asperger's continuum, that we, we had Asperger's moments, if you like, rather than senior moments, or junior moments, or whatever your fancy may be. 
Um, and the reason I wanted, I found it such a persuasive condition to write about was because I thought it was a lens through which to, uh, to reinvent the world, to look at human behavior that everybody could empathize with, that it really was something that wasn't so other from, from all of us, that we could all enter into it in some, in some degree. Um, and th this is, of course, one of those moments when I should perhaps say, of course, I'm speaking mostly for myself, and you can all disagree about this. Um, I'm going to skip uh, 18 chapters. <laughs> <coughs> and um, read uh, from chapter 19, Stephen, <laughs> following along, page 193. Um, uh, though, again, for those of you who are writers, I want to say that this chapter represents a considerable debt to um, a writer named Charlie Baxter, who wrote a wonderful essay about defamiliarization in his collection of essays called Burning Down the House. And the essay talks about how you can make the familiar unfamiliar, how you can make the familiar new. Um, both for your readers and for your characters, and uh, you'll see at once what I've chosen to, to take as my, my topic for defamiliarization. The flight took off seven minutes late, and they passed rapidly through the clouds. Zeke did not relinquish his hold on the armrests until the pilot announced that they had reached their cruising altitude, an uncountable number of feet above the Irish Sea. Then slowly, cautiously, he relaxed the fingers of his left hand and, when nothing terrible happened, his right. It was unlikely that his grip contributed to their continued elevation. For years, he watched the planes passing over London with no apparent help from him. But who could tell? Perhaps one passenger was always responsible for keeping the plane aloft. His friend Mavis had told him about a study comparing two groups of cancer patients. Both received identical medical treatment, but a convent of nuns prayed daily for one group, while the other was left to the usual secular devices. The recovery rate among those prayed for was significantly higher. Why, Zeke had asked. Who knows, Mavis had smiled. The whole point of prayer is that it doesn't make sense. I find it reassuring that there are matters beyond our understanding. Zeke didn't. Perhaps because he had so many more candidates for incomprehension than did Mavis. Now he considered all that he did not know about flying. If only he'd taken the trouble to go to the library before he boarded the plane. This is all a plug for libraries, really. <laughs> if only he'd taken the trouble to go to the library before he boarded the plane. He knew roughly that the fuel was converted into energy, which moved the turbines. The turbines displaced air, which combined with the angle of the wings, drove the plane forward and upward. But this was not a situation in which to leave anything to chance. He craned his neck, listening carefully. As far as he could tell, the engine was grinding away, as it had been since they reached their cruising altitude. I'm praying for you, he whispered, to the cogs, wheels, nuts, and bolts, on which, presumably, their progress depended. Above his head was a light, a nozzle that, when twisted, delivered a puff of stale air and a panel. According to the jaunty film that had appeared on the screen in front of him while the plane was waiting to depart, in case of an emergency, an oxygen mask would drop down from this panel. Hold the mask over your nose and mouth and breathe normally, the film instructed, showing calm, well-dressed people holding little yellow plastic buckets to their faces. Then a different set of calm, well-dressed people put on life jackets, inflated them, and blew whistles. If only, Zeke thought, I brought my own life jacket but it hadn't been on Emmanuel's list. The important thing, Emmanuel had said, as they parted at Heathrow Airport, is not to think about the fact you can't get out. Once on a flight to Mallorca, a woman tried to force the door. It was a mess. Just pretend you're on the Piccadilly line per usual, and you'll be fine. 
This is, by the way, American Airlines Flight 109 from London to Boston, for those of you who want to repeat this experience. <laughs> now, leaning forward in his aisle seat, Seek saw the other side of the clouds, white and surprisingly hard-edged, like the icing they used on Christmas cakes, and then even those were gone. The skies were bright and empty. No birds, no other planes, nothing to count. He remembered hearing a story, about a, a story on the radio about a giant asteroid far away in outer space that was heading toward the Earth. When it arrived, in approximately 900 years, life in its present forms would end. Surely by that time, he thought selfishly, Ms. F and her descendants will have fulfilled their heart's desires. Uh, he calls Verona's fetus Ms. F on the premise that all fetuses are female until declared otherwise. <laughs> Between him and the window sat a courtly, dark-skinned man who even before takeoff had already fallen asleep. In their few moments of mutual wakefulness, he had carefully folded the jacket of his suit, taken off his shoes, wrapped himself in a blanket, pulled a black mask over his eyes, filled his ears with plugs of blue foam, and announced that he was going to catch some Zeds. Do me a favor, he had said to Zeke. Don't let them wake me up for food or drink. How trusting he was. If there was an emergency, Zeke would have to take care of his oxygen mask as well as his own. Still, he was glad to be protected from the window. It was hard <clears> not to worry that the small oval panes might fall out and he would find himself sucked into the brilliant beyond. Another reason to keep his seat belt tightly fastened. Suddenly, the woman in the navy blue uniform who'd been pushing the metal trolley down the aisle stopped beside his seat, <coughs> fixed her eyes on him and spoke. He caught only one word, something. Excuse me? Would you like something to drink, sir? She bent toward him, one hand holding a small plastic bag and a white napkin, while the other pulled down a square of gray plastic from the back of the seat in front so that it rested a few inches above his knees. What sort of drink, he said, and quickly, her mouth was already moving again, asked for water. Water, she said, and scooped ice cubes into a plastic glass, filled it with water, and placed it in the circular depression on the right side of the tray. The plastic bag turned out to hold peanuts, which he ignored, but the water he drank, doing his best to avoid the ice. Still, closing, still holding the glass, he pushed the tray up, it snapped shut in a satisfying manner, and pulled out the contents of the seat pocket in front of him. His haul included a paper bag bearing the words, in case of motion sickness, a magazine filled with photographs of face cream, perfume, watches, and scotch, so glossy that it almost slipped from his touch. Another magazine, the list of things to do when you return to Earth, play golf in Arizona, buy glass in Venice, listen to Mozart in Prague, and finally, a list of safety instructions showing emergency exits, how to use the life jacket, the system of inflatable rafts available in case of a water landing. Um, Zeke takes this, this latter, this map of the exits, and sort of patrols the plane just to make sure the exits are where they say they'll be and that he knows where they are. And um, he feels, and then he counts the number of people in his part of the plane, and that helps to make him feel a bit better too. And then something even nicer happens. Someone brings him a meal, and the meal is all nicely divided, and everything is individually wrapped. You know, the biscuits, the cheese, the hot food, the bread. He's very pleased about that. Um, and so buoyed up that he um, decides to do something else. When the meal was gone, dessert washed down with a cup of tea so tepid, his mother would have hurled it to the floor. He leaned over to ask the girl across the aisle if she could show him how to watch a film. He'd noticed before the meal came the way, to, the way she bent toward the screen, utterly absorbed. What would you like to see, she asked, flipping up one earphone but not taking her gaze off the screen. Something not too alarming. What's your idea of alarming? Violence, talking animals, chase scenes, Anything to do with boats or aeroplanes, <laughs> too much nature, sports. 
<laughs> she pressed a button and at last turned her wide, bespectacled eyes in his direction. In the dim light, her skin was opalescent, and her nose beneath the dark-framed glasses was unusually small and straight. How do, you, <clears throat> excuse me. How do you feel about nudity, she said. <laughs> nudity is, Zeke was about to say, fine, only to be shot through with the realization that until he had seen Verona again, he wanted to see no one naked, of either gender, any age, even in some stupid film. <coughs> Out of the question, <laughs> So you want to watch mass entertainment, but you're unwilling to countenance the mass preoccupations. <laughs> countenance? His anxieties were momentarily lulled by the beauty of the word. The verb means give approval, said the woman. The noun means face. I know what it means, said Zeke. It's just not a word one hears very often. Yes. Most people, said the girl, use only a small part of their vocabulary. My attitude is that besides the opposable thumb, language is one of the few perks of being human. Her head bobbed emphatically. Everyone should try to use a new word every day. That should be easy in America, Zeke said. We'll be learning all these new words, like wow, and gee, and neat, and doofus. Yes, I'm sure my vocabulary will enjoy a huge surge forward in the new world. They're not posh, like countenance, said Zeke. But that doesn't mean they're not words. You're right, she conceded. Basically, I'm a snob. I think the English language reached its zenith with the Victorians, and it's been going downhill ever since. Now, let's see about a film for you. This is a challenge. My name is Jill Irving, by the way. She fished a magazine out of her seat pocket, the one about golf and Venice, and studied a page at the back. Zeke watched her. Nothing she said was especially reassuring, but her peppery remarks made him feel calmer. This woman did not seem as if she were about to die, or even as if she were engrossed in fending off the possibility. For several minutes, he realized, he'd forgotten his duty to keep the plane aloft. And look, nothing terrible had happened. Um, the voyage is perhaps not quite as smooth as he hoped, but he does um, arrive in Boston. And I'm just going to read you a couple of pages of his first rather perplexing day in Boston. <coughs> Excuse me. The man at the desk didn't seem to know, th this is in his hotel, hotel lobby. Um, the man at the desk didn't seem to know what Zeke was talking about. Fog, he kept repeating. I don't think <coughs> so. They're saying a 30% chance of snow later. And then he did something Zeke had heard about, but seldom witnessed. He rolled his eyes. His pupils moved from one corner of the eye to the other, as if someone had twirled them on a stick. <laughs> was he being rude, Zeke wondered? Or was it like the waitress in the coffee shop, who'd found his request for water incomprehensible until he pointed to another customer's glass of clear liquid? Now, as the man kept quoting the weather forecast, Zeke doggedly refused to move. He wanted to go to this place where Verona had been, to take comfort in sharing a few molecules of air with her. He reached for the notepad and pen lying on the desk and carefully printed, I want to go to the Fogg Museum. How do I get there? Then he drew himself up to his full height. It seems like a small thing, his mother used to say, but when you stand up straight, people are convinced that you're a person to be reckoned with. Napoleon, she went on, had excellent posture. So did Tina Turner. <laughs> Neither was an immediately useful role model, but in the middle of the lobby, Zeke did his best to signal that in spite of being an inept hotel guest, he was not going to be intimidated. <coughs> He stared resolutely at an armchair while the man carried his message over to the main desk and, after a lengthy consultation, came back with another piece of paper that he unfolded with a flourish. Zeke was very pleased to see a mass of black, 
brown and green lines. He liked maps, the way they made order out of chaos, and the peculiar fact that you could point to one and say, I am here. <coughs> when his English teacher had been explaining metaphor, how it links two things we normally regard as separate, <coughs> Zeke had been bewildered until he pictured a map. The hotel is here. The man appears <coughs> at clear, sharply hit half, clear, shapely half moons. And you want to go here to the Fog Museum in Cambridge across the Charles River. He indicated a meandering blue line. Either you can take a taxi or the T. What's the T? The subway. In London, you call it the tube. He continued to explain the system, the nearest stop to the hotel, the nearest stop to the museum, where to change. Zeke wrote down the crucial information. The idea of traveling underground was at once appealing. Surely down below, Boston could not be so different. Thank you, he said, slipping the map into his pocket. One of the um, pleasures of reading is that you can sort of invoke the parts of the book that didn't make it from your desk. Um, oh, thank you. For, from your desk to between covers. Um, <laughs> and um, at this point in the novel, in my mind, there followed a, a quite lengthy um, harangue about the terrible state of the Green Line. <laughs> you know, that it was decrepit, that it was dangerous, that it wasn't handicapped accessible, that it was bewildering, uh, on, on and on. And, and then there followed a, sharp, a slightly shorter harangue about the red line and how hard it is to travel on the red line if you're feeling a little troubled because there are so many advertisements saying, do you have ADD? Is someone you know a little short-tempered? Does your partner abuse you? Are you hearing voices? You know, all those advertisements for hospitals looking for volunteers. Um, oddly, my editor felt that these were of slightly local interest. <laughs> so the green line remains unchanged and there are just as many advertisements on the red line. <laughs> But Zeke manages um, to uh, get to um, Harvard Square. <coughs> and I'm just going to read you a little section about, about that. Outside, he discovered again the bitterly cold day and half a dozen boxes containing newspapers, some for sale, some free. A small flock of telephones clustered together amid the snow. As he studied them, he heard a roaring noise and looking up, saw two planes flying overhead, the only familiar part of the landscape. Everything else was different. The brick sidewalks, the low, muddled buildings, the cars on the wrong side of the road, even the shapes of the leafless trees. No, not everything. Right behind him was a shop selling soap and shampoo that had branches all over London. He crossed Church Street past an ochre-colored church and came to a snowy expanse surrounded by black railings. A park, he was thinking, when he noticed several, black, several dark slate stones punctuating the snow and recognized a graveyard. <coughs> the railings led him to another church, this one made of wood painted light gray with beautiful, clear windows. Standing on the front step, he took out the map and located Harvard Square. All he had to do to find the museum was retrace his steps, walk up a street called Massachusetts Avenue, and turn left on Quincy Street. He was outside a bookshop when he spotted a metal effigy, like the one he'd seen from the taxi the day before. He bent down to examine the silver body and faded orange helmet with its snout and two stocky arms. Even on closer inspection, it seemed to have no obvious use. He stopped a passing boy and asked what it was. It's a fire hydrant, said the boy. If there were a fire, the firemen could connect their hoses to this, he pointed at the snout, and get water at high pressure. Is fire a particular problem in Boston, said Zeke. Got me, the boy whistled. We do have some wooden buildings, but you see fire hydrants all over the country. I bet there was a blaze somewhere, New York or Chicago, and somebody invented some paranoid law. That's how a lot of stuff happens here. 
Thank you, said Zeke. You're welcome, said the boy. Welcome to what? Zeke wondered. But it seemed to be the expression Americans used to conclude conversations instead of no problem or right or take care or cheers. He turned a corner and there was the museum, a handsome stone building just where the map said it should be, and it was open. Inside, a sign requested six dollars. He was muddling over his wallet when a voice said, excuse me. A woman dressed in black reached over the counter, deftly extracted two pieces of green paper, and in exchange handed Zeke a metal button. Wear this in view, she instructed. In the two-story courtyard, he closed his eyes, trying to summon Verona. Maybe he should ask the woman behind the counter if she remembered a tall, pregnant Englishwoman visiting the museum recently. But when he glanced back, she was talking on the phone, one hand shielding the receiver, as if whatever she was saying was too good to share. The courtyard itself was pleasingly symmetrical, with a row of arches like upside-down U's on the ground floor, and a row of double arches like M's above. On one side was a shop selling closed, but selling, he guessed, postcards and souvenirs. He headed for the stairs, passing a wooden statue, a saint, clearly very old. On the poorly lit landing, he paused in front of a picture of another saint, the gloomy-looking Saint Dominic, holding a large book. The accompanying label claimed that the painting had, had originally been done around 1246, but within a few years, it had been altered twice in pursuit of greater verisimilitude. An earlier version of the left ear was apparently still visible in the middle of the face, but not in the dim light to Zeke. If at first you don't succeed, he thought, and made a little bow to Dominic. Um, he's invoking, of course, the Scottish outlaw hero, Robert the Bruce, who famously hid in a cave on the mountainside in despair with the success of his rebel efforts and seeing a spider trying to anchor its web across the mouth of the cave was heartened by the arachnids repeated efforts and went on to fight great battles and change Scottish history. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you weren't all thinking of Robert the Bruce when I said if at first you don't succeed. <laughs> um, I will stop there but I'd love to entertain questions. <laughs> woven into my opening chapter because I recognized that it wasn't going to be on the tip of every reader's tongue, as it were. So um, I got away with that. <laughs> but I'm always, um, because of my sort of mongrel transatlantic life, because I view myself as having readers on both sides of the Atlantic, um, I'm always trying to smuggle bits of my Scottish childhood and history into my American, to my American readers, and, and also vice versa. Well, I have a question about omniscience. I, I, I haven't read the book, so I don't know whether this, the reader is solely in the head of Zeke, or whether you, whether it's limited omniscient, in other words, you choose one character to be inside. I didn't hear anybody else that you, whose, head, whose head you were in. I'm just wondering, how you, when you're working on a novel, how that decision, I'm fascinated with it right now, at least in part because I finished Middle March and she gets in everybody's head. Um, you know, which is a little excessive perhaps, but, but how, how do you arrive at that decision, who to enter and who not? Well, when you're working on a book? Um, soon after I met my friend's son, I, you know, I started having the idea I'd like to write about some, somebody with Asperger's syndrome. And I started auditioning this character for a role in, in novels I was working on. So when I wrote a novel called Criminals, I thought, now, could he be the person who finds a baby in a bus station? And I thought, no, no, very bad news for the baby. And then when I wrote a novel called The Missing World, I thought, could he be the person who keeps his girlfriend semi-captive after she loses part of her memory? And I thought, no, no, my, my character would never do something 
something like that. And finally, I came to the somewhat reluctant decision that, that Zeke needed his own novel, and that that novel should take place, of course, in the arena he finds most, most complicated, the arena of intimate emotions. Um, but um, I also realized that um, to write the novel totally in Zeke's head was going to be um, quite problematic. So uh, throughout the novel, um, you go back and forth between Zeke and Verona. Um, so we have other periods when someone can immediately decipher facial expressions and <laughs> move briskly through the world. Is it a relief to get there? <laughs> well, it means you can have quicker plane journeys and shorter plane journeys. You know, you, you have different rates of doing things. Um, both were actually a pleasure in different ways. And, um, I loved writing about Zeke. I loved trying to see the world that differently. Um, and the hard thing was not to the hard thing was to stop writing about him. Really. But I also loved writing about Verona. I'd always wanted to have a kind of tall, bossy woman character, and finally I do. So that was very satisfying. Speaking of characters, I was also fascinated by the two minor characters, Emmanuel, his guide in a sense, yeah. as well as the nurse that he met on the plane, yeah. and uh, in, in, in another sense, guided him into the new world. Yeah. Uh, could you speak to about those two characters well, and how they came about? Well, I had, besides wanting to write about someone with Asperger's, I had a number of other ambitions. Um, one was to write a quest novel, because the quest is one of our oldest, I think, most compelling literary forms. Um, however, it turns out to be more complicated to write a quest novel in the age of email and mobile phones. I mean, Odysseus would have been home in about 20 minutes if he had a cell phone. It was the conclusion I came to after um, comparing his situation with that of modern characters. Um, and I also wanted to write a love story, and that seemed really a preposterous ambition because we have so many love stories, and who needs another one? So I felt under particular pressure, I mean, I wanted to combine the two, uh, and I felt under particular pressure to tr try to make the material new, partly through the use of Zeke, and partly in other ways. And one way I approached that was by thinking of the novel like, and this sounds pretentious, but I don't mean it like this, of thinking of the novel like one of Shakespeare's plays, where, or perhaps like an opera, where things happen in, in a major key and then are repeated in various minor keys or, you know, things are played out between Lear and his daughters but also between Gloucester and his sons, for instance, or between um, the lovers in A Midsummer Night's Dream and then between the rustics in their play about Pyramus and Thisbe. And, and I've, I've always thought that was um, a, a wonderful way of organizing a piece of art. Um, and so I aspire to have Zeke and Verona as my main characters, but around them weave various subplots, which are also thematic reflections of the peculiar um, difficulties of, of romantic love and of this big question, you know, can we ever know another person? And if we can't, then what? Um, how do you proceed from a position of ignorance? Yes. In looking at different cities, Mark Twain once, uh, in comparing different cities, said that in Boston you ask the question, what do you know? In New York you ask the question, what are you worth? And in Philadelphia they ask, uh, who are your parents? <laughs> and I'm just kind of curious as to how somebody with Asperger's would look at different cities. I mean, you're, you're giving some hints, so, so is this all just bits and pieces? Um, you know, Zeke does spend a, a you know, a, a little bit of time in Boston. I have to say that he spends much of that time in the company of the woman he meets on the plane, another English person. But he encounters a number of Americans whom he attempts communication with, um, with varying degrees of, of satisfaction and, and pleasure. Um, but I don't know how he'd answer that question, and I'm going to have to think about it. <laughs> I mean, in what you understand when you read the no novel is that Zeke is someone who's survived to the age of 29 by making his life very safe in London. He has sort of these routines that carry him through his, his day and his week. Is there a question by the way, would be asked, you know, from your point of view in London that could parallel any of Mark Twain's oh, collective views? Yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> as someone who grew up uh, 
lower middle class, which is really a terribly annoying thing to grow up. I'm <laughs> I'd probably ask all three questions, but, I, but I'm always, um, yeah, I have some difficulties with who, both who my parents are and how much I'm worth. But maybe I could do the what do you know. <laughs> Me in the right place. <laughs> taking the familiar and making it unusual. Yeah. And I see you do this extremely <coughs> effectively using Zeke, but as you were reading, I was saying to myself, well, this is a character who you can do this with because of his limitations. Uh, could you expand a little more on how you would um, talk about taking the unusual and making it extraordinary? Did you all hear this, this very eloquent question? Yes, I mean, this is... Um, <coughs> You're completely right. I took Charlie Baxter's idea of defamiliarization, and in a sense, I took a sort of easy route by taking a character who looks at the world in a very questioning way from a very particular angle. In his essay, what Baxter talks about are those moments when you know, husband and wife come back from the theater, and he suddenly looks at her across the grilled cheese sandwich, and she looks totally different than she's ever looked before some mysterious way. So he takes those moments when sort of consciousness takes an abrupt swerve or goes off the rails um, in res with respect to familiar relations, um, either between people or between people and objects. And he gives wonderful examples of, the, of both how to do this and of the psychology that perhaps lies behind those sort of swerves and, and how we can make use of them in fiction. But I, I, I'm doing a terrible job of paraphrasing his essay, but all I can say is, you know, it is a wonderful book for writers, one of the best books I know, um, in terms of keeping writers company in, in the endeavor. And, and, the title is, and the title is Burning Down the House, which he stole from, I think, The Talking Heads. <laughs> You know, when I was when I was younger, I could have, um, because I think when when I was younger, my habits as a writer were terribly important to me because no one else cared if I wrote, so I had very rigid habits around writing. Um, you know, I always wrote from I can't remember eight till twelve every day, or something like that. I was I was working in a restaurant, so I, I worked split shifts, so I probably worked actually from eight till eleven. And then I work between lunch and dinner in the afternoon. Um, as I've got older, I've tried to become less superstitious. I still prefer to work in the morning. Um, but if I can't work in the morning, I'll work in the afternoon. <coughs> if I can't work in the afternoon, I'll work in the evening. Um, I still um, prefer to have a stretch of time. Um, but if I can't have a stretch of time, I'll take 45 minutes. As Ethan, I mean, Ethan Kanan claims to have written all his work in you know, 45 minutes a day before going to the hospital. And, um, Andre de Buse, uh, Jr. says, uh, you just need 90 minutes a day. That's all you need, and you can write more in peace. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm not quite with these people on the kind of, on the 45 to 90 minutes, but um, I have tried to become more flexible as I got older because I felt my habits, rather than supporting me, were imprisoning me, and that I needed to learn to to be more flexible, to accommodate more interruptions. Um, do you use a keyboard or do you write by hand? I use a, like so many writers now, I do use a computer and every summer I go to look at manuscripts in the British Museum and the British Library in London and I look at those glorious opening pages, you know, Pride and Prejudice rolling down the page or Ford Maddox Ford rolling down the page or the Ancient <coughs> Mariner and I think you know, we don't, we don't have better books than those books. Um, so I try to use a keyboard, but use it questioningly to think about where, again, the computer may be um, imprisoning me rather than liberating me by making me endlessly revise <laughs> when what I really need to do is to go forward as those writers did. Um, and I think the great vice of a computer 
<laughs> I speak for Apple here. No, no. <laughs> I think the great vice of a computer is that it always returns you to the beginning of your work. So you really need to be on page 14 of your story or chapter or whatever, but instead, there you are back at the opening page yet again. And you just notice that that sentence in the middle of the second paragraph isn't working quite as well as it should. And you think, well, maybe if I just pause, I'll fix that sentence. And suddenly, two hours have passed. And by the time you get to page 13, your, your first energy has perhaps slightly dissipated. So I do try to urge the people I work with at, at Emerson and elsewhere to try to question how they're using the computer and to think about how it can really be helpful um, rather than perhaps um, Mephistophelian, I guess is the word I'd use. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs>